This is People and Their Poems, a podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world. In each episode, writer and educator Sandy Carlson talks with a person who has been influenced by poetry and become a poet or a supporter of this literary form. Stay tuned. I think some people write just for themselves, right? But I I think a lot of the times we're writing to share. So having a really supportive and encouraging and uh, active community and in, in whatever ways that that, you know, is interpreted by different people in different places in their life. I think it's so important to have people who are saying like, yes, this is a worthy pursuit. Go for it, be you, share it. I wanna hear it. I wanna comment on it. It deserves to be heard. It deserves to be published. Hello and welcome to People and Their Poems po- podcast, a podcast about the poems that matter. I'm, I'm here today with Katie Schneider of Norwalk, Connecticut. She is a co-host of Foom for Live, the published writer of I Used to Remember the Story of How. And she's here to talk to us about her experiences as a poet, as well as a promoter of poetry. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much, Sandy. I am really honored to be here. Well, I am honored to have you and your beautiful energy and um, to expose <laughs> our audience to all that you do as a writer and for writers. Would you just uh, introduce us in some more detail about the kinds of things that you have done both as a writer and a promoter of writers? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, well, I, I myself am a poet and I really uh, started to get involved with poetry, um, uh, I would say, starting in undergrad more seriously. And I was connected then um, at Fairfield University to Kim Bridgeford. So she started to introduce me to uh, Metso Kameen and the Metso Kameen Women Poets Timeline Project, uh, both both, um, things that that she ran at the time. And uh, then I got into the Fairfield University MFA program in creative writing, which began right when I graduated, which was kind of perfect for me. So I followed Kim uh, over there and through that program, I met all of these incredible people. And um, we really formed just this really supportive, wonderful community. And um, that's where I met my dear friend, Chris Belden, <laughs> um, with whom I've done so many wonderful, like fun events, music things. Um, and we were just, like I said, we, we created this really great friendship. And during quarantine, we... Um, uh, we realized we are not going to get the chance to do anything in person for a while. <laughs> so like like quite a few people at that time, we said, well, well, why don't we try to bring this online and make that happen? And um, so we started an, an online uh, literary reading series where we would bring on our friends who had published books from our MFA program, current students and alumni, and uh, then that would also reach out to local folks and, you know, folks across the country, even abroad, um, who either had a a published book or like a significant um, amount of activity uh, online or in person sharing, uh, sharing their writing. And uh, it's been this incredible journey ever since then. So we are we have over a hundred live streams uh, out there on Facebook, YouTube. That's Fun for Poets and Writers Live, um, and uh, that's one thing that that we have going on. I hope that uh, anyone watching out there might follow us and and uh, um, watch us most Sunday evenings. We are now in person one <laughs> one weekend out of the month at Eco Evolution in Norwalk. That was wonderful. Um, since the pandemic has as has receded so much we've been able to start doing that since July um so we're hoping to engage the local community even more in that um for myself I you know had a manuscript after my MFA I edited that quite a lot <laughs> over the years and then a few years back um uh finally had a version that I was ready to ready to start sending again and finishing line press picked that up. And that was the most exciting, um, you know, 
poetry moment for me. So very, very proud of this. Um, and I have a second manuscript that is looking for a home right now. Um, I also just try and stay active myself in, in the local community and among the kind of wider community that I've met through doing the live stream um, by attending things like the New York City Poetry Festival and, and seeing what other ways I can, uh, you know, participate in like locally and also online to, um, to participate in poetry community, to support other poets, and to kind of share what I'm writing. Yeah, that's really terrific. Um, what I hear in what you're saying, the common thread is community and being to together. Yes. To share that, plus the editing process. Can you um, can you just speak to what you feel is the the real value of people together, whether it's through a screen or in a room, sharing their work, and hearing feedback, what is what is the ultimate value, do you think, of that for mm -hmm. you and as a poet and writer and for others as writers? Oh, you know, I think, uh, I think it might be a little bit different for everyone. I would say absolutely the, in the editing process, in the sharing process, um, you know, in, in the workshop process, which is just in, inherently communal, like you really getting really important feedback from everyone. You're understanding how things are landing, how people are understanding the, the things that you're writing, the things that you're expressing, and, and getting really fabulous feedback um, from that, which just propels you <laughs> into wonderful places with individual poems, series, uh, series <laughs> collections uh, that, that, that you're making. And so that that is so essential. Um, but even if you're not in a in a workshop group, um, if you have a writing community where you're sharing your work, where you're supporting each other, where you're encouraging each other, I think that is such a fundamental thing because to even take the step of picking up a pen or putting a word on a page, like you have to believe in the value of doing that. You, you, and um, I think some people write just for themselves, right? But I I think a lot of the times we're writing to share. And so having a really supportive and encouraging and uh, active community and in, in whatever ways that that, you know, is interpreted by different people in different places in their life. Um, I think it's so important to have people who are saying like, yes, this is a worthy pursuit. Go for it. Be you. Share it. I want to hear it. I want to comment on it. It deserves to be heard. It deserves to be published. And I think that is the most important and essential aspect of community for me. So uh, it, it means so much to me when when I receive that, uh, that, that awesome encouragement and support from others. And I try to also then be that for others. Um, and I think that creates just a really, really wonderful uh a wonderful life-giving community and that is a sustaining to you know to the the art form as like the 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 work itself and the, the money that goes into it and, and all these other factors so I think the the encouragement and support of community is probably the most essential thing that's probably most important to me well th thank you you know it's art affirming and also I think you said life affirming yeah you know, the yeah. Whatever I've lived that I'm bringing to this page right now, I want to share that with somebody. That requires tremendous vulnerability. Absolutely. And trust. And so I'm, I'm always amazed when people are willing to share with people they might not know. Yeah. And Absolutely. That's, that, there's tremendous hope in that, too, that people, that the, the fact that they put the effort and the time in. Yes. Makes... The, the risk taking all the more valuable and when people are willing to do that in a public way yes that is our hope I think one million percent yes um and, and I, I kind of tell people um you know on the surface of it especially if you are not a writer yourself or if you've only like let's say written something yourself and like hidden it away in a journal which is valid that's that's fine that's great um kind of coming to when you invite someone to a reading or when you say someone's gonna gonna read from their book or it's gonna be a series of of um, of poets uh, or many maybe multiple poets or an open mic sort of scenario uh, some people at first might be like oh I don't know if that's my thing I don't know if that's gonna be interesting to me and I just have to tell them you will be surprised right because if you just say okay I'm gonna go I'm going to listen it, um getting to dwell in the richness of people's thoughts and creations one of the coolest 
and most interesting things you can do and kind of be transported from wherever you are, whether you're just sitting at home or like listen, you know, listening to something or whether you're in an indie bookshop or in a cafe, wherever you happen to be, a, a library, <laughs> a, you know, presentation room or something um, that you get to be a part of these things that you get to learn about different people's experiences. Um, and, and you've just really invested about I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour of your time that, you know, you'll say, this is something I need to do. This is something I want to do. And my parents, like I said, have always been really supportive of me, but I said, you know, I invited them a few years back to this reading where there was many poets. And I said, you know, I know you're there for me, but I'm sure you're going to find this experience you know, even even more fascinating and exciting than than you think it is, because uh, you know, I, and I had some friends coming too where I said the same thing. They're like, well, you know, we're excited to to see you. What about these other people? What is it going to be like? I said, you're going to love it, <laughs> and that's exactly what they came out with. They're like, ah, you know, it, I feel like we met all of these different people. We got into their minds. We got into their interests. You know, things that maybe I've never explored before, and I got to, to have the chance to, you know, to to do that. And so even for the people who are not themselves like poets or not themselves people who are actively writing or part of literary communities to to have these public readings public events you know events at, at venues open mics um it, it draws people in and then you have this community of people like, wow you know I never thought about that before but now like you said I'm, I'm learning these new things about different people I'm learning about you know their their interests their background their concerns these uh, certain well, political issues. And um, I think that is so precious and so important. And that only happens in that community context. Yeah, that marketplace of ideas is really, we think of as foundational in our in our culture. Yeah. Is there a, is there a particular poem that brought you to poetry or that has a, had a, an impact on you as a, as a writer that you could share with us? Absolutely. Well, this was a very hard choice, Sandy, when I was preparing. <laughs> Because uh, it's so hard to remember like a, a specific thing and it, it, uh, kind of I think from like my lifetime immemorial I've, I've always been someone who was drawn to the arts and very moved by music and, and art and poetry so it's, it's really hard to like find like a one thing but I, I do want to share a poem that really kind of inspired the trajectory and subject matter and style that that I currently write in. And um, that also kind of captures a bit the the style uh, of of my biggest mentor. Well, my my first mentor, I should say, uh, Dr. Kim Bridgeford, amazing, amazing, amazing poet. Um, she recommended Mark Jarman to me back in the day in undergrad. Of course, um, is is such a fantastic um, poet who you know at, at times really does. Um, uh, you know, talk about the divine, you know, uh, and um, this poem really influenced me that I'm going to share with you. So it's from his book, Epistles, and the poem is the very first poem in the collection. And so when I first got this on recommendation from, from Kim, and also uh, as part of my master's degree, my MFA at the, at the time, I was reading a lot of poems, contemporary poets who were um, engaging with um, spirituality, engaging specifically with Judeo-Christian spirituality, um, biblical references that was really interesting and important to me at the time, and it still is maybe in a different way. Um, but I love how this poem like kind of holds up across all these different years of my life and um, and, and how he is engaging with the spiritual, with the divine, um, with humanity in this poem. So I'll go ahead and share it without further ado. Okay. So it's called If I Were Paul. It's a little bit, it's a little bit long. It's about a, it's about a two pager, but I will go ahead and read it. Mark Jarman, If I Were Paul. Consider how you were made. Consider the loving geometry that sketched your bones, the passionate symmetry that sewed flesh to your skeleton, and the cloudy zenith once your soul descended in shimmering rivulets across pure granite to pour as a single braided stream into the skull's cup. Consider the first time you conceived of justice, engendered mercy, brought parody into being, coaxed liberty like a martin from its den to uncoil its limber spine in a sunny clearing. 
how you understood the inheritance of first principles, the legacy of noble thought, and built a city like a forest in the forest and erected temples like thunderheads. Consider as if it were penicillin or the speed of light, the discovery of another's hands, his oval field of vision, her muscular back and hips, his nerve jarred neck and shoulders, her bleeding gums and dry elbows and knees his baldness and cauterized skin cancers, her lucid and forgiving gaze, his healing touch, her mind like a prairie. Consider the knowledge of otherness, how it felt. Consider what you are meant to be in the egg in your parents' arms under a sky full of stars. Now imagine what I have to say when I learn of your enterprising viciousness the discipline with which one of you turns another into a robot or a parasite or a maniac or a body strapped to a chair. Imagine what I have to say. Do the impossible. Restore life to those you have killed, wholeness to those you have maimed, goodness to what you have poisoned, trust to those you have betrayed. Bless each other with the heart and soul, the hand and eye, the head and foot, the lips, tongue and teeth, the inner ear and the outer ear, the flesh and spirit, the brain and bowels, the blood and lymph, the heel and toe, the muscle and bone, the waist and hips, the chest and shoulders, the whole body clothed and naked, young and old, aging and growing up. I send this to you, not knowing if you will receive it, or if having received it, you will read it. Or if having read it, you will know that it contains my blessing. Ooh, I love it so much. Oh my goodness, wow. <laughs> oh, oh, I love it so much, Sandy. <laughs> well, I have never heard that before, but the movement from the physical to the spiritual, from the blessed to the, the cursed, oh my goodness. So powerful, so, yeah. so powerful. And, and I love how it is, you know, it's recognizing this, this kind of beautifully abstract imagination of, of kind of the, the, the beauty of existence, the physicality of that, and how, how beautiful and precious and fragile it is. And then going into the, now imagine what I have to say, you know, about, about what you're, how you're treating that, how you're thinking about this. And um, also this uh, encouragement to like realize this and to use everything that you have at your disposal to bless others instead of hurt them and use them and abuse them and then this last part where where he mentions you know I don't know if you'll even hear this I don't know if you'll even receive this message I think there's such realness in that um you know and and I think that is so so important in any kind of spirituality or religion. We can get very caught up in the in the history of it, or or like this sort of ethereal beauty of it, right? But if what we're believing in, in my opinion, is not you know caring for and serving humanity, <laughs> right? If we're if it's not helping us to take care of each other, it's really it's really lost and. Um, I like how the title itself kind of puts him in that mode of like, if I were Paul, if I was this person with this voice responsible for speaking to and guiding these people, this is what I would say. And I just love that. I really, I really, really do. <laughs> I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. You know, and just to hear the the body parts mentioned and the, the choice mm. between being a collection of parts or a being with a soul poured into our the, the the cup of our skull right that i think that was the phrase oh my goodness yeah and what happens when we forget that that there is that there that we are not just a bunch of systems hanging together inside right. some skin that's right that's right and you see pictures of the war in ukraine and you see mm. human beings reduced to bodies in the street and oh. uh, i you know i i recall you're saying before you read this that this poem is held together throughout the course of your you're writing life and I'm yeah thinking, oh my god the application individually how do i behave and then the universal how do we behave yes and, yes 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 and you can turn this boat around yes <laughs> you know, yes you can. That, way, you know? that is a very beautiful choice of poem to read so thank you thank, thank you for for that oh it's a pleasure to share it and and honestly like that that poem is 
been so precious to me. It, it really feels like an honor to have an opportunity to share it like this and, and in the context of, of what it has meant to me and, and how it's influenced me. Um, yeah, thank you for that opportunity to share it. I'm, w I'm wondering if now would be a good time for you to share something that you've written since this poem has had an important influence on you. Would that be okay? <laughs> Absolutely. I think that would be perfect. Um, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so um, the poem, it was very hard once again to, to choose a poem that I wanted to share, um, you know, that kind of, I guess, is sort of me and where my poetry is at in a nutshell, you know, uh, for, for this moment on this podcast. Um, but I chose a poem of mine called City on a Hill, which of course is a biblical reference, you know, a gospel res reference here. And I have um, start out with a little quote from Matthew. Um, and this references a pretty amazing opportunity that I had in, in my life. I just pulled together my pennies on a shoestring and uh, actually traveled to the Holy Land myself. Uh, that was a dream of mine. Um, but just important as, as important to me as it was to like, wow, get to be in these places and see these incredible, um, you know, um, historical, biblical locations and places. Uh, it was equally as important to me to see what's going on with the people right now, right? If we're just going there and looking through the lens of ancient history and what we imagine about the Bible, we're only going to see one thing. We're not going to see, you know, the, the, the very human issues that are present at this moment that are, you know, just as important, you know, but in my opinion, much more important than, you know, than that, than just the experience of, of just seeing history or seeing, you know, biblical places. What's going on with the people now? And if we, if if we believe strongly in these values of of love and justice and mercy, then then we need to think of that too. And I think that po this poem touches on that. I have other poems in my uh, new manuscript, which this one is the first poem in the collection um, that talk about different aspects of this trip. So just to get you excited about that. Um, it was a pretty amazing experience, and I hope I was able to capture it well in, in my poem. So anyways, 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 without further ado, this is my poem, City on a okay. Hill. Thank you. I have a scripture quote that gets it started. Uh, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And that's from Matthew 5, 14. I am a city on a hill. I know what Jesus meant. I saw it myself. I saw the cities on the hills in the Holy Land. Out of the terminal, into the van, we drove through the night, Israeli street to Palestine. I saw the cities on the hills. They sparkled in the black ore of the crisp January sky, exposed, twinkling, bright. I am a city on a hill, eyes fixed to the window. And when we crossed the army-guarded checkpoint into the Arab village, the scene came more to life. Christmas decorations strung up across the streets, parallel parking car beeps. I swear I saw a man riding a horse, inexplicably. The driver made friends with me and he stopped to buy kunafa. We ate it as he drove with sticky fingers. And there I was in a hotel in Bethlehem, moved from a basic room to one with a balcony, I could see out from inside the city. Each day I looked out. I walked around the ancient places and the newly built. I thought about what it means to be a city and a light. And what are all the structures and things except dust not yet pounded out? And what really matters except the lives of the people who live now? And if this was the longitude and latitude where Christ was born and is no more? Then ours are the mortal bodies that hold the holy wisdom and the option to conjure life with its power. People are the only holy cities, the contrast in the silent night. We are the living truth cast on the screen of time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, I have to say, I'm very glad that I, that you emailed that to me in advance because the phrasing is so beautiful. And while you were coming to your conclusion, I was just grabbing that, that phrase, that mortal body holding holy wisdom, right? It just speaks back to that German poem about our responsibility. Are we a collection of parts 
are we going to, we're going to live it. Thank you so much. Yes, 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 absolutely. You know, what, what are we, what are we doing? You know, are we just this collection of parts? Are we just living, living for ourselves, for our own needs? You know, does, you know, is that all that, that, that matters? Or do we live in a society? Do, uh, does what we do have cosmic meaning? Is it important to us, you know, that we, that we care for others? You know, do we believe that it's cosmically important that we care for others and also, and also our world, you know? So when we, um, especially what, what, being, being in the Holy Land, seeing these special places, you know, um, if you're willing to see the layers that are there, if you're not just seeing this old church, these old stones, Jesus was here, right? Um, and you're actually seeing, okay, he was here and and look at all of the bullet holes from this war in this ancient gate. What What is that about, right? Look at all these layers of empire after empire. Like what did that do to the, to the, to the people who were here? you know, look at around you, you're, I, as an American tourist was able to walk where neither Palestinians or Israelis could go easily because I didn't have either of those backgrounds, right. In, in my, in my passport. And, um, you know, I, I saw the difference between the way Palestinian people were treated and the way Israeli people were treated coming in and out of Jerusalem. And, um, that is, you know, are we willing to see that? Are, are we willing to uh, to apply this this beautiful religion, these beautiful beliefs, to more than just ourselves, right? Especially if you're in like a lot of the Protestant world, you're talking about my personal relationship with Jesus, and sometimes, you know, I I joke with my mom. I'm like, that almost sounds like you've got your personal pan pizza. You know, <laughs> my Jesus, just mine. What is he doing for me? You know, and uh, it's like, well. And I don't want to ever, ever offend. Everybody has their own beliefs. I respect it. But, you know, it's like, well, yes, that's that's for you. But if you believe in this, then you also believe that God so loved the whole world. That's the reason he was sent, not just you in, in your life, in your country, in your context, right? So, so uh, what is the kind of the higher calling, the higher challenge to recognize that, to to um to actually have this love and care and awareness of, of what other people are going through and what that you know what that means to them so uh that's really important i feel like that is re reflected beautifully in that if i were paul poem really really inspired by that and something that i'm trying to do in in my poetry weaving together this concept of of holy land you know what 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 is holy land what is holy territory and and how are we you know respecting that how are we abusing that how are we repressing that and um that's it's really important <laughs> to me i i hear you and you know um i was thinking while you were reading your poem i'm thinking of those holy sites and on a more personal level, I think if we get caught up in our own beliefs and values, it's almost like people who inherit stuff and are fighting over the dishes that they're never going to eat off of. Right. <laughs> Why? You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, how many boxes of stuff do we need to, <laughs> you know, what is that? And, and when do our beliefs become so many boxes of stuff? Because we're not really looking at them. We think we know what's in there. You know, and and I'm saying this from somebody who was looking for uh, an heirloom the other day, and I found a box of balled up newspaper. No. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking if we're gonna get those heavy rains. I better get this box off the ground before it gets right. soggy because of all the stuff, and there's nothing there. And I'm just thinking of those those antiquities. You know, does if they rob us of who we are as human beings, let them go. Yes, 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 yes. I, I completely, I completely agree. You know right like we have these we have these places we have these antiquities we have we have all of these things and um you know we can we can look at certain issues that we we sometimes get to see in the news often from very skewed perspectives but if we just look at the story itself you know um uh, one thing that that often happens in certain places especially in uh, parts of maybe Jerusalem right which is part of the state of Israel proper um it's not part of the the occupied territories which have, have never been incorporated into Israel and are not their own thing. you know it's 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 a whole story we all need to google that we all need to learn more but um you know families who have lived there for forever <laughs> you know since since their family can remember be having their land taken from them um, so that something can be dug out from from underneath 
their their home, you know, or so that certain things can be can be moved and removed. And you know, who who owns that? Who is that important to? You know, who is? And um, you know, I think there is a problem. <laughs> now there are so many different so many different things that are going on that you know that are huge justice issues. Um, you know, especially especially um, in in terms of what I what I had a chance to see, especially in terms of. Uh, Palestinians not not receiving the justice that that they deserve in these in these contexts, um, but um, you know like what what matters here right the 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 the, the artifact under under your house or the family living in that house right uh, what what matters like the you know this this road for tourists or the village that has existed <laughs> you know forever uh, or this or oh my god or the settlements that you want to build and and sell to people right or or the people who have lived on that land you know for thousands of years it's you know it's a very it's a very tricky thing and um people are not above using all different kinds of political and economic measures to just to just get to just get what they want in these situations and to, to use to use religion to abuse religion in certain ways to to get what they want and the, you know do the people matter, right? Like we're we're talking just just briefly about the this this issue of of DeSantis using these migrants uh, in in a political stunt, trafficking them, if you will, um, to Martha's Vineyard. You know what? Do these people matter, right? If you're if you're pro life, people are supposed to matter, right? Life is supposed to to matter to you a lot, so much so that you're making these restrictive laws, and uh, you know I don't agree with that. I think you could be pro-life without going in that direction. But, you know, you're going to treat people in this way. You know, it's it's just it's just wrong. It's just wrong. I, I agree. And I, you know, I listening to you, I think it's interesting how your your poetry set in the Holy Land, it transcends that. And I think any place where people are home, uh, that word is so important, you know, and all the all the places in the world where there are conflicts. Yep. It's about home. And how do we how do we honor that? And I'm I'm wondering, is there a, a way? And I don't know, is there a way to get poetry inside of the heads of these people who treat other human beings like political pawns? <sighs> you know? Um because I, I think the, the power of your your poetry takes us from empathy to compassion, which I think is actively doing thank you. Based based on if you, you feel empathy, you you act with compassion. It's requiring you to to demonstrate how you feel, you know, it's a doing. Right. And we saw that on Martha's Vineyard. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the follow-up story in the post today was um, they enriched our lives. The people the, the people at the church on the vineyard said they enriched their lives and they were sharing their story of, of the um, these human beings flicking through their phone. This person died, that person died. And it has to be surreal to to sit on Martha's Vineyard and and look at this and get this this right. lesson, but also to act with such compassion and to demonstrate for the world what it looks like to just be nice to people that they could pull together fifty beds, find mm -hmm. meals, play mm -hmm. space for the kids, and get it done. It's really not that hard, <laughs> you know. No, it's it's not that hard. It's not that hard, and it's it's not hard. You know, I think. So, so, so much prejudice and, and bigotry is rooted in, in fear, right? Like, you know, this fear that, that I or my group is not going to be dominant or, you know, and that's so wrong and it's so antithetical to human rights. It's so antithetical to so many American ideals. It's so antithetical to core Christian beliefs, you know, but when we make this very unholy alliance with, um, you know, with, you know, our idea of love, you know, we only love these kind of people. We only serve these kind of people. We only serve the people who are like us and are going to advance our, you know, our ideas that it is so wrong. And uh, almost that's kind of one of the most evil things to, to, to twist these ideas like that. Like, no, 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 it only serves these people. When, when you look at it, like, you know, just the word, when people hear the word migrant, you know, we automatically categorize that as like less than a resident, less than a native. No, 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 no. This is a person. These are people, <laughs> okay, who 
were lawfully seeking asylum, right? These are these were, and, and and even if it doesn't, even if we don't even think of that, these were people who were used. These were people who were lied to. These were people who were abused, right? They did not deserve any of that. And the people on Martha's Vineyard treated them like human beings, right? They they didn't they they took care of them. They showed them mercy. They showed them care. They gave them what they need, and and especially in light of what they had gone through already, right? And that's an example, one hundred percent to to everyone, because what, you know, inherently in DeSantis's whole plan, he's not treating these people as, as, uh, as, as human beings, right? The only people worthy of, of, you know, his version of America are people exactly like him, right? So no one else, no one else is, is worthy of that. And, you know, in doing this, it also was tremendous, uh, disrespect to people of a different political ideology, right? You know, not treating not treating them with respect at all. And um, I, I think this has been such a powerful and important, um, you know, way of seeing things, the way words are used in these situations, right? Right, right. Um, I think as, as a woman poet, as, as someone who in my own life has like struggled with certain kinds of like self-worth issues, it's like, um, no matter what somebody says or does or tries to maneuver things, like, is this person that I'm involved with treating me, uh, treating me like a human being, treating me with care, treating me with dignity, with respect, um, respecting my rights, respecting, you know, who I, who I am, et cetera. And, um, you know, we have to be willing to, to believe like I am worthy of, of that care and respect and um and to, to say like this is not right this is not right for me and it's not fair and i think seeking justice and freedom and equality and freedom from oppression repression for for ourselves is sort of just as important as as seeking that in the world because you have to believe once again that 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 you that you are worth it and that that is wrong right no matter what your fancy words or position are um that that these people are worthy of being treated well just because they are humans <laughs> right and um and uh they they deserve to be they deserve to be respected and cared for so so you know i think you really kind of affirm for me the poet in society it's not just the the well-chosen word but the purposeful word and the desire to engage the world around us in a meaningful way to make a difference and and I think that requires tremendous risk taking. One hundred percent. I can I can attest having having met met you in poetic settings and been a guest on Fum for Live that you you live the message that you just delivered about treating people with courtesy, respect, and dignity, and mm -hmm. and a pure joy that is so inviting and so welcoming. Um, it just invites the people around you to jump in and and be a part of that conversation. And I think that's where our hope is. If there's no reforming. The bad guys. I think that the bad guys will ultimately be overwhelmed by the, the goodness that we find in each other and that you find, uh, that you identify in the poems you choose to read as well as the, the poems you write. Thank you so much for everything you just said. That means so, so, so much to me. You know, I'm, I'm not per perfect, but I'm, I'm certainly, I'm certainly trying to do my best um, with my, with my work and with my support of, of writing community to, to make that, to, to make that difference. And I know how hard it is, how hard it can be for, for people to, to change because certain things become so much a part of their identity and they're so afraid to change. But, um, you know, there, there are whole communities of people who have, who, who have kind of realized different things and who have changed. And I think that writing can also show you the, the path to do that, make it, you know, and, and make and make a, a, a transformation or a, a change in, in behavior or beliefs or politics, you know, seem like that's something that I that I can really do. It makes it maybe in a way less scary. Um, but anyhow, yes, yes, yes. My website, we you can find us on Facebook, also on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. Um, we are F U M F A Poets and Writers Live, FUMFA Poets and Writers Live. Um, if you do a Google search, you can easily find us. Um, that's facebook.com uh, slash 
uh, FUMFA Live, F-U-M-F-A Live. Um, and on YouTube, uh, the, the URL is not really neat and tidy, but if you go there and search for us, uh, just subscribe, follow us, and then you'll um, start to see our posts um, and notifications. We do set up event invitations on Facebook. If that's, uh, that'll help you get a little reminder that we're, that we're going to go live as well. Um, and you can find me, you can find me um, on Instagram under the story of how, kind of like part of my book title. I used to remember the story of how, the story of how with uh, underscores between the words. Um, and uh, ho hope that, that you'll that you'll have to follow us there. You can also find our in-person information on on Fumfa Live, uh, our Fumfa Live page. Thanks, Katie. And we will put links in our podcast notes so they're accessible that way too. So we'll get people to you any way we can. Thank you so much, Sandy. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. <laughs> this has been People and Their Poems, a podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world. Be sure to check the show notes for any special links relating to this episode. If you want to learn more about the podcast, visit peopleandtheirpoems.net. Or if you want to learn more about Sandy and her work, visit sandycarlson.net. Thanks for listening.